Hello, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be kicking off with another episode of Vina Talks and the Life. Uh, together, we are extremely, extremely joyous to be welcoming Chris, uh, and you will very shortly be understanding why I'm expressing myself so enthusiastically. Um, can I just also say huge thank you for everybody who's been giving me the feedback uh, with regard to the podcast, the materials we share, the personal stories, uh, the lived experiences. Please keep them coming. And by all means, do provide the tip. We can always afford to become better. And certainly myself, probably my pace of talking or anything else you, you, you might occasionally find does not resonate. Please let us know. But without further ado, floor is yours, Chris. Would you like to please give us an introduction about who you are and also what brings you here today? Thanks, Pina. And um, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here, get to talk to you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Chris Woolno. Um, yeah, what well, brings me here today? I guess, you know, from a, a maybe a business perspective and then a personal perspective. So from a business perspective, I'm the UK MD for a business called Assurant. Um, we are a business that is really driven to advance the, the connected world. Um, and we do that fundamentally underpinning by insurance. So we insure connected devices, phones, gadgets, vehicles, uh, houses. And we do that with some of the biggest blue chip companies in the UK. So large banks, um, some of the big major telcos, big major retailers. Um, but I guess what brings me here today is probably more linked to my personal life and how kind of having a child uh, who is neurodivergent has impacted me both at home and in the workplace. So uh, I have three children. Uh, I have two boys and a girl. And my middle son, who is eight, uh, called Thomas, is uh, autistic um, and was diagnosed when he was five. And as someone who probably didn't, you know, prior to him, have very little interactions with anyone who I would have known was neurodivergent, it's been a huge kind of learning curve, huge awakening that I've then tried to take into my working life in terms of having a, a greater understanding, awareness, appreciation for people who are, are neurodivergent. I myself uh, am neurotypical. Um, and um, yeah, so it, that's kind of what brings us here. I think the second piece of, of that then is the things I've been doing or trying to do in order to initially raise money, but probably has turned out to be more so raise awareness for neurodivergence. Um, and and actually what I started off doing was was really wanting to support some small local charities that were near us that had helped us with my son. So my son was uh, probably about three, maybe when we started to notice things. Uh, he went to the same preschool as my my eldest son, who's now 11. And my eldest son had a great time there, progressed as a typical, you know, neurotypical child does. Um, we started to get a lot of feedback from my second son, Thomas, from the preschool, you know, strange behaviors. Um, he didn't really want, he had quite attachment issues. He wouldn't want to go in, was quite upset, which we took as kind of being just, you know, a, a kid that doesn't want to go to school. Then that happened more and more, and we started to notice other things, obvious things, you know, um, eye contact was a challenge for him at times, very specific interests and very hyper-focused interests, all kind of now things that I would recognize as being um, ASD uh, characteristics. Um, and so we started down the pathway as he was five, and, and we were incredibly lucky uh, that he got his diagnosis very quickly. We didn't have long waiting lists, which I know um, many people who I've spoken to since are, are struggling with. So he got his diagnosis very quickly, and as a result of that, we were able to really, through the, the work of my wife and the efforts of my wife, really get in touch with, with local charities who were able to help us with things, you know, swimming lessons, uh, rebound therapy, things like that. <clears throat> and so I wanted to see what I could do to raise a bit of money for those charities. And that was initially the kind of the, the thinking. Um, and so I've done a few 
things before uh raise money through things like marathons and things like that and so i decided that i would do uh, a marathon but i wanted to do something that was quite different quite difficult so i went down in december and ran a marathon in antarctica um and did that uh did a lot of um uh communication in the lead up to it about neurodiversity on linkedin uh, and facebook and then other things, local radio, press and things like that to bring to life why I was doing it. And the thing that I think blew me away and I didn't expect was actually that we raised a bit of money, which was great. But we didn't raise as much as I thought we could. Um, but actually what blew me away was the awareness and the amount of people, e even so much as just this week, um, someone here in Assurance just reached out to me on email to ask me because they've got a two and a half year old son that they believe is um is autistic and they wanted to know you know how did i go about that what did we do what did we identify in him they're kind of really struggling in terms of support networks and, and who to look to for advice they wouldn't have known who to reach out to had i not been really open about our situation because of the run and that was the thing that i think i found most interesting was the sheer number of people who came out to me to say my son my daughter my niece my nephew my grandson my granddaughter uh, he's going through this, he's going through that and, you know, really appreciate you bringing to life and also bringing to life the struggles, right? Yeah. Having a child who's neurodivergent is difficult. Um, it's super difficult. At times it, it's difficult as, as a couple, you end up arguing about what's right and wrong and how to do things. Um, but yeah, so that, that that's kind of a long-winded way of me to explain it, why, why I'm here. Absolutely perfect. What can I say? I mean, if there was an epitomizing sort of moment of anybody on this uh, podcast series so far who's uh, able to really get into the nitty gritty of the why, you definitely come top of that list. So no, thank you very much. Thanks so much for the sharing. Thanks for also everything you are doing and no doubt you will be doing to raise awareness. Raising money, again, as a person who's very keen to fundraise is one thing, but really it's not sustainable. Uh, everybody's happy to contribute the fiber and I mean, by all means, anything more beyond that. But what we are seeking as people who are there for the long term uh, is the awareness, is something that's solid, something that will remain um, beyond us and our legacy, how small or big that might be, and, and, and really will be able to sustain what we're doing into a positive change, a change that's gonna help and support our people the people of uh, of our children or their own children, et cetera, et cetera, and essentially the community. You mentioned a few things, and I've been trying to frantically take notes because <laughs> I believe um, also in helping our audience um, in terms of, as you said very correctly, their own lived experiences, the families they're supporting, the friends, but also how they take this the, 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 this phenomenon um, the, this uh, circumstance also into the business world. And um, the first note uh, that I've taken is you speaking about us around in, in the way that you help the connected world. Uh, as a person who works directly sometimes and others indirectly with technology, obviously that makes me think of IoT, the Internet of Things, right? Where everything is connected that we get a nice way to feel well supported my first question to you and and by the way can i just say this this episode is dedicated to thomas um <laughs> absolutely all the way and i know he would he wouldn't care but thomas that's for you and for everybody else out there who who really um just holds up the flag of being themselves and calling it out um and i, I and i love this um yeah Whatever attachment is you or specific interest or whatever it might be, just be yourself is my hashtag of the day. But back into the connected world, how connected do you feel we are as a as a workplace, as a community? And and how this experience of neurodivergence running in your family has enabled you to feel perhaps the need of a little bit more connectedness? Wow, it's a great question. Um I, I think it's interesting when you think about connectivity in the workplace, it's really hard to then not think about both the pre, post and during COVID period. Like I'm I'm someone who pre-COVID, I, I would have said, 
I love being on my own, really don't need social interactions. And you know what? I'm more than happy to be kind of at home all day, just you know, head down, work. What what COVID taught me was that actually connectivity is great, but I, I really value and need social interactions with other people face to face. Um what I also found interesting during the period was a few people reached out to me. Um, I guess because I am quite open about the challenges that we've had um, with with Tom, a few people reached out to me to share how beneficial it was for them because they were neurodivergent to be at home, right? And one of the things I think which is pretty amazing about Assurant is that we have been really flexible about return to work in an office environment. We have basically said, you know, if if you're able to if you if it works for you if it works for us then work from home we're hyper flexible most people in our business work on a hybrid environment some of which you know one day a week in the office i think that the one thing i think the one challenge we have with connectivity in the workplace is how do we bridge that with mental health um one of the worries i repeatedly have is it's really difficult to check in on people and how they're doing when you don't see them um, you know, partly because it takes a lot of effort, but secondly, because, you know, all I have to say is, yeah, I'm doing fine. And on a, on a camera, or even if I've got my camera switched off, that is, um, that's, that's really kind of difficult. One of the things, one of the hardest times for us was trying to homeschool a neurodivergent child. Right. And I, I, there'll be loads of people who can remember this period and who it was hard enough to try and homeschool my neurotypical child neurodivergent i mean he he refused outright to do anything he 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 was really difficult in terms of getting him to to engage um you know you put the ipad up and say hey we're going to do a quick hour with your class that's never going to happen he's never going to do that it's just not you know my son also uh was diagnosed with pda so he has pathological demand avoidance so you say to him right you need to sit at this laptop and do some work that you just he's just not going to do that he'll say no or he'll he'll just walk away um and so that was a real difficult part like for us connectivity with him it, it doesn't really help it's not it's not his thing he, he'll happily play on the ipad he'll happily watch stuff on the ipad but it's not a it's not his be all and end all and it's not a way to get him to connect with education um, but yeah, I, th I think to me, the, the connectivity for us in the workplace was was super helpful. It meant that during particularly the period of COVID, we didn't drop a ball. We carried B BAU. Um, we put a massive focus. I certainly put a massive focus on engagement and and really worrying about people's mental health and worrying about how do we how do we ensure culture remains. You know, culture is much easier when you're all in the same place in the same building. It's way easier. Um, you know, you can have a quick chat in the, in the coffee queue and check how people are. It's very different if you're all at home. So we focused a lot on kind of doing everything that everyone else did, you know, pub quizzes, kind of drop-in sessions, panels, you know, ask ask questions, podcasts, all those kind of things. We did we did all that kind of stuff and we've tried to carry a lot of it on. I think, as I say, when, it, when it's kind of come to the, the home life, it was a lot trickier. And, um, you know, we were... Like everyone else, we were we were very quick to want to get him back into school at the earliest opportunity. But then equally, I still worry now as to the impact that that period had on him. You know, he he, uh, he we have dealt with repeated bouts of school refusal, repeated, repeated struggles with anxiety, um, you know, to the point of which he, he was diagnosed with anxiety by the doctor, by his GP. Um, and yeah, it's. It, it repeatedly we have we have challenges with with Tom one of the again I don't, I don't know enough to know if this is typical but one of the one of the big things we have with Tom is he's fundamentally different dependent on the weather so we all are a little bit like that but um you know today is a very cold wet rainy day in the northwest of England I know he'll have had a difficult day if a day is beautiful and sunny he is so happy he's outside all day he doesn't really like to be inside likes to be outside so when it's cold in winter you know he's not good so lockdowns were hard because the weather was bad at times and he couldn't do it he, he was stuck inside um so that yeah that's the other piece that's a challenge for him 
I mean, very conscious of the fact that I don't want to be my joking self, although humor does help you go yeah. through challenges in life. On behalf of my compatriots, Greeks, Thomas <laughs> always has a special, <laughs> you know, bless. and that's across the year. Okay, I mean, we do get some. When you, when you were saying um, about your marathon, you know, Devils uh, back in December, and I know full well because I've run the Athens, the uh, the classical uh, marathon a couple of times myself, so I do know very well when it takes place, and that's not December, it's October, but it's, uh, I, 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 I heard you saying, okay, I, I thought I would sort of um, try out something difficult, I thought, fantastic, yeah, come over to Athens and try and run a marathon, <laughs> 30 degrees, that's going to be good. And I've got an even more difficult one for you, which is Thessaloniki, the north of Greece, the second largest sort of city. And I know that I'm digressing, but that is on the motorway. And typically you run one way of the motorway and the other one is fully oper operational. Really? So your breathing system, exactly, your lungs um, get fully charged <laughs> or or collapse oh. together. You're either or. Um, yes. Anyway, um, I, I was referring to nice summer holidays rather than anything. Uh, no, thank you very much. Look, connectivity, um, and by the way, a little apology to Asurant because I um, did a wrong intonation earlier, so it is Asurant, I, I think <laughs> it's it well now. Um, it, it's, it's very important to acknowledge uh, mental health issues. It's also very important to acknowledge the fact that if it wasn't for COVID and this odd occasion of one's cat jumping on you know, the, the desk as somebody's having an ever so serious sort of client meeting or a semi-naked child sort of mm -hmm. running behind the scenes. And that allowed us, whether we want it or whether it would have been intentional from us or not, to really come to terms with the fact that, hello, people, this is my life. This yeah. is part of my life. And I think that already in itself, despite the lack of the water cooler sort of moments, where typically you would go and, yeah, queuing up for that coffee, you would have the chin wag of, oh, good weather, yeah, what do you do on the weekend? And things quite on the surface. We were now almost sort of thrown into the deep end of, yes, this is my six-year-old who's now trying to get ready for his swimming. Yeah. Not that he was running, but, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> Where's that? No, right. So... I think we were all on the same boat and whether neurotypical or neurodiverse, we were all, again, as parents, had an issue of juggling and managing and balancing the expectations of work as well as the expectations of running um, a household. And can I just salute you also on what you said with us earlier? Something that I get quite a lot from fellow parents and fellow neurodivergent parents who often speak not in the presence of their other half, um, mm. but on their own, and they actually admit to some strain on their relationship because of either their own child or children um, uh, diagnosis or indeed their own. And, you know, it's, it, it's great that we as parents have this inherent, obviously um, undisputed sort of connection with the fact that our children need to have our support but how about those one amongst us who in the 50s the 60s or even speaking you know about me in the 40s going through diagnosis um who also have a dependence who also have relationships across the sort of board of living that is something really important for us to consider and i find that workplaces need to start even more for those who already do acknowledge that if we want really to be speaking about culture, that has to be part and parcel of us speaking about culture. Otherwise, everything is very superficial. Yeah, Com I completely, completely agree. I mean, for me, it's kind of what this has opened my eyes to. I, I mean, I don't think it would have done if we hadn't had Tom. I don't think this would have opened my eyes to this. Is to me, there's there's kind of there's two very different threads here. There is how, as an employer, do you create a culture which is uh, accessible, open to everybody, you know, and appreciate that, you know, frankly, and I I use Tom as the example, right? And I, and it's not that's not me generalizing, but I, I have to relate to my son. There are some things he is incredibly good at, and we talk about him and say like these are his superpowers, right? He 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 has 
you know, intense levels of hearing. He can pick out sounds that we can't and he can replay them and he can pick them out in other things. And one of our challenges as parents is to work through, okay, so how can how can we help you to foster that into something as a career or a passion or whatever that looks like, right? And that's just one example. But then the piece is that neurodivergent children, adults will all have those superpowers, right? And so how do you create a, an organization that is able to really foster that? And can really tap into those skills, right? You know, my my son probably does prefer to be on his own to being with people. So therefore, I would rather be in an office with other people. He would not. So how do we create a diverse culture that empowers people to do both those things, right? To me, that's one big focus. And I think, I think actually most organizations, that's where their focus has been. I think what this and our experiences with Tom has opened up is we also have to support the parents of neurodivergent children more so than neurotypical children. And, and I'll give you some examples. You know, there are times where midway through the day, I get a phone call from his school saying he needs to come and get him. Right. He's he's gone, he's at capacity, he, you know, he needs he needs to go. There are times where I take him to school and he won't go in. And I'm 45 minutes late to get back for a meeting because I've been stood at the playground with a child who's refusing to go into school. And it's, and that happens to, you know, neurotypical children as well, but it, but it happens more frequently. You have all the meetings, you know, annual reviews, EHCP meetings, it, all of these sessions. And, and one of the things my wife often says to me is when you go to a lot of the, um, a lot of the ASD groups, it's all moms, no dads, right? And it's like, how, as, as a, back to your point about a couple, how do we both show up and support each other and support our children? But also how, how do we take that into the workplace in so much that I, I as an employee feel supported to be able to do that, right? It's easy, you know, if I think about my team here, you know, get to the summer, everybody, disappears for a few hours to go to their kids' sports day, right? It happens all the time, right? It's fine, go and do it, right? But actually, from some of our experiences, the parents of of neurodivergent children, that needing to disappear off the stuff happens a lot more often, a lot, a lot more often. And I know that, I know of people who have been in our teams who have who've been through really difficult times um, and, and as an employer, it's really important to make sure that it's not just about creating an environment where you support someone who has neurodiversity. It's about supporting those people who also support children with neurodiversity and the impact that has on them and their working environment, because it's, it's really difficult. And it's, you know, I, I laugh at Joe, your, your point Vina, before, you know, one of the things my son repeatedly likes to do is be naked. He doesn't like clothes on him. He doesn't like the touch of clothes. So I'll be on zoom and he'll come in, <laughs> he'll be naked behind me. And I have to kind of go, you know, but please just put some pants on or something um you know it's uh it, or, and he has no awareness like if i'm on a call and he wants me to to put a game on for him he'll he'll just you know he won't leave me alone right and that's that's a, that's a child for you but i think to your point that's kind of one of the things that's been great uh, as a positive from covid is that acceptance that we're all parents we're all we've all got lives and actually that glimpse that people have had into our lives to see kind of, you're not just, you know, a boss or an employee or whoever you are, you, you know, you're, you're, you, you know, you're a person who's got a life, I think has really helped actually. And at times it's kind of, you, you know, you do laugh about it and, you know, tell stories about crazy things that have happened because of the life we lead. Yeah. And you connect so much more, you connect yeah. so much deeper and then you understand each other because again, life happening, that means we all fall into a temporary situation, a permanent situation. Again, um, a great example there is neurodivergence and the dependence, the children we have and how we need to be there for them, support them into adulthood and acceptance and support by the society. Um, but again, you don't have to be a parent to be in this kind of permanent. Yeah. There's many other conditions, situations, challenges, um, stuff that life um, invariably throws at us and we yeah. need to show a little bit more empathy. And and again, something that I get to find myself um, as blame from myself uh, frequently. And, and nowadays, because I've 
I've reflected and because I've already got myself into the space through the work that I do with and for gain um, of, of more empathetic and more appreciative of if somebody comes across more rigid does not necessarily mean that they don't want to hear you or to befriend you or to listen even to you. Yeah. It could be that they were in another space, they were thinking something else. There were so many other, or perhaps the way that I asked that question was not leaving too much room of, for anything else than a you know, straightforward no, or whatever yeah. that might be. So yeah, that, that helps us grow. And I think if we do get ourselves to grow individually, then we will, by definition, also become better employees and better contributors to a corporate. And I think this is where the magic happens. When the infrastructure has been enabled at the corporate sort of setting to empower those people who are embracing the journey of individualization or um, the kind of getting to know the self, then you can do more and more because this is this is this is utilized. This is now becoming part of your additional arsenal of skill sets and attitudes that you can offer Absolutely. on. That's diversity. Uh, that's diversity. Precisely. Yeah. And you know, often enough, again, through my work again, there's times that I catch myself thinking and going back to my own sort of mentally to my own sort of corporate journey so far. Often enough, we, we identify a missing skill set or something that we're not particularly good at. And we kind of go, okay, let's open a black book and, and find out who can offer this training. We'll put yeah. it down the channel of training. Let's let's offer training, a couple of hours, breakfast, lunch, offered, you know, just to entice more people. But there's so many amongst us within the same workplace who could easily give such a training, albeit from the heart. Yeah. Um, completely you know, easy to to represent others and also coming from the people who speak the same language, speaking, obviously, being of the same sector, which is a double whammy. It's an, it's an added benefit for people to, to empathize, to warm to the idea and to kind of translate it into something that speaks our language. So it's so important to get to know each other more um, and to, yeah, and to be open enough insofar as our journey allows um, I don't know whether you know, probably you do, and I don't know whether our previous sort of our introductory chat went into it, but I'd love to give a little shout out to the IFN. You see the IFN that stands for the Insurance Families Network, again, is, is an insurance-wide driven initiative um, that connects parents of neurodivergent people in the main, um, but also the, the children with genetic conditions, things that basically, therefore, um, put the parents in a slightly more awkward than the average parent yeah. sort of daily life. Um, and, and they feel the need to to embrace these, but find acceptance. Occasionally, the relief that we say, oh, my God, I feel relieved. And that relief moment means that we can go on for another year without complaining because yeah. we know that somebody else is is seeing it and we're not alone. This kind of the feeling. Um, and together with gain or individually, um, they do organize events and the atmosphere of parents who suddenly are able to just open up the hearts and speak about those, those stuff can be really so enhancing. Um, That's amazing. And, well, it's all because yeah. people also have shared challenges. Like we, we yeah. you know, if I think about one of, the, one of the conversations my wife and I have almost daily is how... Um, the education system is just not geared up for neurodiverse children. Right? It's we have that every day, and and you know we we talk about it and say you know our eldest son is neurotypical and he just breezes through education. It is made for him, right? It's made for him. But the challenge is that uh, certainly our our son uh, is high, you know he's high maintenance. He he needs a lot of one to one support. He needs a lot of alternative approaches to education. You know, if if a school is dealing with, uh, say, phonics or spellings or English more generally, and part of that is because you know, they're doing Lord of the Flies, say, for example, my son will just demand avoidance will kick in and he'll go, 
I don't want to do that. I want to read about Star Wars. Yeah, and it's like that is, you know, it, you have to have a really good. Uh, the education system is just not really geared up for that, right? And every time you try and push him with someone who's not had any form of diversity training, you try and push him to say, no, no, we're doing this. His demand avoidance kicks in again, more and more intense. And and at a point in time, he's he's gonna gonna want to leave that school. He's want to go home. He's done. Um, and so actually, the techniques are to say. You know, through schooling, there are, there, are, there are attributes you need to show, you need to spell, you need to do maths, you know, those things. But you don't have to do them the way that it's said. You know, if you've got an interest and that interest allows us to expose that you can do those things, then we know you can apply it everywhere, but you've demonstrated it in something you're passionate about. That's really hard in a school environment. And I think that's that's kind of one of the, you know, you talk about the IFM, that, that, that's one of the things I think when we talk to other families, it's probably one of the most common things we talk about is kind of like, what's your experience? How do you deal with it? What, you know, have you looked at alternative schools? Like, is that an option? Is that worked? That's, that is so hard. It is so, so hard. So true. As a matter of fact, my other good friend, Ian, um, his son, uh, I believe 12, um, he currently goes through um, a very heavy um, and attention demanding uh, stage of yeah refusing to go back to school he's um particularly gifted when it comes to robotics and putting things together and incredibly curious about the things that he really wants to feel engaged mm. in and with but not with anything else and you know though and and i don't want to take this discussion away from from our educational system and indeed home's experience and and, and ours as as parents because i get um, my nine-year-old um to tell me how boring school is and every so often particularly last year he was insisting that he doesn't want to be going I mean we didn't miss out although I came very close once to say you know what yeah let's 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 go to the Lido for a little bit of a swim forget <laughs> forget school but it's all about how do we keep curiosity and critical thinking and creativity alive and rather than sort of being a black or white zero or one system you either do the spelling or you don't why can we not afford to give options but this is for a long long time what i've been experiencing in the workplace to be honest to you chris i right. think that we're now thankfully we're speaking about flexibility and hybrid uh working arrangements and that's by no means across the board only very specific and few and now declining in number places yeah. um so why it, it, it reminds me of what you said earlier. Why do you get into that room that's almost exclusively just mums speaking about the children experience? Why not the dads? Um, and also, obviously, we all know it, it's to do with the workplace. It's, it's the societal sort of expectation or indeed status quo that it is the, the male, the, the dad, who gets to go to work or has the important sort of job and the mother, even if she was once or she would never be because she knows that a hefty part of her life is to, to be with a family. And many parents, many, many male parents, many fathers don't want that to be the case anymore. So yeah. we all owe to, to contribute. We all owe to contribute. And I suppose that is why we're having those podcasts. And that's why you and I are here today because we want to lead by example and we want to sort of say to the world that we need to give each other permission to be, permission to live true to our own chosen purpose in life and the values that we hold important. And that doesn't take away the, the, the ingredient of having a successful career. Successful, perhaps easily um, changed into purposeful or intentional. Yeah. Uh, that will uh, give more light onto it. Before we close, because... Okay, time flies. I, I was checking out the, the, the time and I'm like, oh my God, you know, and I still haven't gone anywhere close to reviewing my earlier notes um, mm. from, from your introduction. But perhaps uh, two little things that I want to touch on. One, I'll, um, I'll do another plug, actually. They came into my life very recently. And since you did mention the small local charities, I don't know whether you know, there's this incredible London-based charity, which is the London Autism Charity, Okay. Or London Autism Group Charity. Um, Dr. Uh, Papadopoulos, um, fellow Greek, although he doesn't speak a, a word of Greek, 
Well, that's <laughs> something I need to publicly name and shame. <laughs> um, they're doing incredibly powerful uh, work locally um, with with parents and children um, getting support um, from a psychological sort of perspective from from specialists. Um, they have they have socials once um, a month in, in different neighborhoods, even in the city of London. Um, incredible work. So very much I'm a, I'm a, I'm a believer in that mantra community makes stronger and yeah. i think the more we connect each other into the good things and the good initiatives and the warm people who really want to do something there uh and lift up marginalized cohorts i think we ought to know them and to try and support each other as much as we can yeah absolutely my question now sorry i'm, I'm not a host i shouldn't be i should stop calling myself a host i should be, I should be calling myself the person who always expects <laughs> to talk as almost as much as the, as the guest, <laughs> with apologies to everybody and including yourself, Chris. <laughs> Honestly, you spoke about fundraising, and my question. And often enough, I speak with parents who say, "You know, our our kids believe in sports icons and legends, and obviously." loads of kids into football, although I'd like to believe that half of mine are into rugby as well. That's another thing. Um, and we don't often see neurodivergent examples in the sporting sort of community. No. If you do a lot of sports-related fundraising, can I have your your own sort of two cents on how important is sports in our life and if you can build in into the mental health and yeah. As as adults, but also well, that's children. exactly that's exactly it, right? It, it, it to me, to me, fitness is, I mean, just physical health and mental health are so closely linked, right? I mean, it's kind of, you know, I wear you'll see, I wear my my whoop, doing a plug for whoop. I um to me, you know, a combination of physical fitness, sleep, and management of sleep, uh, nutrition. Um, all of those things combined make a material difference to my mental health. And those things all combined make a material difference to my ability to succeed in the workplace. Uh, it's, it's obvious. I know, I know that the fitter I am, the better I am in the workplace, the less tired I am, the more mentally strong I am, the more resilience I've got. You know, if you're, if you're physically unfit and had poor nutrition and poor sleep, because um, they all go together, your performance in the workplace deteriorates significantly. So for me, it's, yeah, there's no, it's kind of, even if I miss a run, if I miss a run or a gym session, my mental health is impacted immediately that day, immediately. So I, yeah, I um, it's one of the reasons why, like people will ask me often, you know, why do you like running? Um, and I'm not very good, right? I'm not fast, I, I, I but I love the free time and people will say you know when you're out running what do you think about and i'll say well nothing the only way i can describe it is that the second i start running it's like one of those extra sketches when you wipe it my head just gets wiped right and it's kind of and i get back and i just feel so much better and i've found that there's almost no problem if i do want to think about stuff there's almost no problem i can't solve on a two-hour run by the time i get back your head is clear and, you know, your endorphins are kicking in and you feel immediately better for kind of what you've done. So I, I, I yeah, you don't need to run a marathon, but I, to me it's, yeah, it's vital. It's one of the things I really try and encourage in my children, but it's, again, it's hard. My, you know, trying to encourage my child, children to come out with me and go for a run as opposed to playing on Fortnite is a difficult negotiation, right? It's, they'd much rather be playing on Fortnite. But I, I encourage my, my children as much as possible to do, sport because it's also really important from a team in perspective you know you talk about rugby football you know those team games are massively important that you know one of the most powerful things you learn as you progress in your career is that you can be a phenomenal individual but you will not succeed because that's not how you progress you progress by being a phenomenal part of a phenomenal team and at times you're fortunate enough to be a leader of a phenomenal team and most of those times the people that work for you are way better than you are 
right way better and actually that's not your job anymore your, your job is to kind of m motivate them and support them and give empathy and give strategy and give direction but they're the stars they're the ones that do the work but yeah so i i that's another long-winded answer for you about how i i yeah can't, i can't value it enough what can I say? Long-winded answer. That was the, the, the absolute highlight. Um, I, I've noted down your progress by being part of a phenomenal team. If there's one takeaway, I mean, honestly, it, it's taken me uh, more than two decades to appreciate the power of a team and bringing different sort of components together. And you encapsulated that so beautifully in one sentence. And how inspirational is that? Can I just say... Massive thank you for everything you do to fundraise and to awareness raise. Um, there should be a concept, a, a term in its own right. We are thinking money with obviously capitalist systems, the economist uh, yeah. hat on, although too much here today, I'm not quite sure whether the hat would fit, but uh, it's, it's so important to put money on the side um, every so often and think about the thinking, how much of a difference we can make with a little bit more empathy, a little bit sort of openness and yeah, a more balanced life, uh, more exercise. Um, by the way, to parents of uh, neurodivergent children, I would also say, don't introduce your children to boxing as I've really very badly did. At any point in time, especially when you're half asleep still and you're trying to get them off bed, you get boxed out. And that's <laughs> not the best awakening. I'd rather have caffeine, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think your point about the awareness, to, to, I know you're trying to close, but if I think about the, the, what I've learned from this is, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm being specific about parents of, of neurodivergent children, but I'd imagine, to your point earlier, a 40, 50, 60-year-old who's going through a diagnosis, the thing that you're not immediately looking for, certainly as a parent, is you're not looking for a charity. <laughs> what you're looking for is support. What you're looking for is advice. What you're looking for is examples of what other people have been through. You know, right now, you know, we, we're, we're also going through my son, an ADHD diagnosis, and we're stuck in the system. We're trying to work out, should we go down a private diagnosis route because we want to be quick? But if we get a private diagnosis, we get different answers on, will we be able to get medication or not? And what we're looking for is other people who've been down that route, that, that system, guidance, support. Now, sometimes you do get that from charities and that's fantastic because, you know, you give examples. But equally, if I think about what's really blown me away is the messages that I've had from people, both on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram, on uh, just in the office, on email, or, or people have just walked up to talk to me to say, can I just ask you a question? My grandson is five and he this is what's happening. What would you advise and I almost always say, you're talking to the wrong person. My wife is the expert. She's dedicated her life to supporting my son in ways that I will never, ever appreciate. But I know a little bit. And let me let me tell you, and, and almost always those people say, do you know what, it's just great to hear someone else who's going through this. To me, that's what awareness is. How do we do a better job of saying to other people, you're not on your own. You know, you're not on your own. We are going through this and here's how we're coping. And, and if we all do that, then I think... Uh, I think, well, I, I know it makes a massive benefit to your mental health because at times you do feel like you're the only people dealing with this, right? You, you do, and that's hard. Absolutely. And no questions are daft questions. So people ask away, be respectfully curious, uh, try and help. And it's always, okay, it, it's always so much more believable to know that it comes from a fellow human and a fellow human with that lived experience. So trust. It, it's always difficult to be the first one to trust. But when somebody is open with you and they're happy to share their own experience, then you don't need to look any further. You've got it. You've got a person who's worth your trust. Chris, really, from the depths of my heart, thank you so much for your time today Thanks and you. for all your honesty. Thank you. Take thank care. you. Thanks.